uh, where was I? The more, <laughs> yes, the mavr, uh, mavr. Yeah, so what I was gonna say is that, okay, so I, the, the fact that that moment when he wants to sort of present himself as the uh, oriental other or the other in, in Venice, it, 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 he, he still does it within the realm of cano Western canonical literature. That was my point. So his, his, his sort of marginal identity is that of a, a, a great, great creation of, of, of Western canonical literature, namely Shakespeare's Othello. And, uh, and, and when we think of the various marginal identities and underdog positions in, in, in already in the 1980s, let alone now when we were dealing with global migration and whatnot, so this kind of a displacement that he, uh, and marginality that he presents is not exactly the, the sort of a, a global underdog, if you get my meaning, so it all takes place in this sort of realm of high culture, if you like. Now, Susanna, I, um, yes, somebody pointed out there is definitely an erotic or perhaps a sexual moment in this emergence of the marble thighs of new Susanna. And without a doubt, and this is something everybody who's read Brodsky's watermark, knows there is a sexual subject, subtext to Brodsky's Venice. Venice sort of is a, a, a is over and over again this kind of an unattainable object of desire, it's personified especially in watermark. In, 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 for instance, in the Venetian lady who meets who meets the author uh, um, at the station when he arrives in Venice, and this is of course the the first uh, or Bro Brodsky recounts in this uh, essay the, his first visit to Venice. Now, Venice personified as a woman is nothing new again, uh, and, and a na naked woman at that. It's part of the Venetian myth. Uh, it's one of these sort of conventions of representing Venice in uh, artistic and, and literary traditions. And, and, and um, since the 18th century, Venice has been associated in, in European culture with erotic license. One only has to think of Casanova. And, and besides that fact, there is also the uh, long tradition of the, uh, like I just mentioned, um, depicting Venice through a person, female personification in Venetian art, starting with the Renaissance Renaissance artists. And then to go back to literature, I'm sort of going back and forth here now, but to go back to literature, uh, in the English language literature, the person who is, who's really associated, the writer who's associated with this kind of a, approach to uh, um, Venice is, is Lord Byron. And I referred to Lord Byron yesterday, and of course, as soon as you mention Byron in, in the Russian context, Pushkin emerges instantly, although Pushkin was never, I guess I mentioned yesterday, he never visited Venice, and he didn't, he didn't write in any detail about Venice, except that, that there is that moment in Yevgeny Onegin where he, sort of, he starts with imagining the uh, Adriatic uh, um, waves, but... Um, Byron, I think, is very much present in this sort of ironic postmodern way in Brodsky's Venice. And in Venetiansky's Trophy Adin, where we, we briefly discussed yesterday that there are all these sort of musical metaphors, there's this elegiac uh, uh, Venice. Well, that goes back to, if you want to look for sort of a, um, uh, classical references and sources was for that kind of a, a representation of Venice, uh, here, Lord Byron's Child Harold's Pilgrimage, which is a, a narrative poem with four parts, and the last part that came out in 1818 um, relates to Byron's visit or stay in Venice. Byron stayed in this city for some time, and the entire canto for the fourth part of, uh, of, of Child Harold is is dedicated to Venice, and here, in Venice, Tasso's echoes are no more, and silent rose the songless gondolier. Her palaces are crumbling to the shore, and music meet not always now the ear. So this is the kind of similar imagery that uh, Venetianski Strofiadin is, you know, felt with. And um, about other classical references, well, uh, Goethe, who is another famous writer, famously, visited Venice many times. And, um, and here I think Brodsky's playing with the title of the poem. The title, Venetianski's Trophy, um, especially if you happen to know that Brodsky also wrote a cycle titled uh, Rimsky Legi. So we have Venetianski's Trophy, we have Rimsky Legi. Well, who else is Rimsky Legi? Römerche Legi, Goethe. He also has Venetianski Niestrofi, ah, 
epigram. Yeah. And again, in, there you have this certain kind of erotic moments that I, I think Brodsky probably has in mind. Now, uh, getting back to Susanna and some of the Russian intertexts in Brodsky's Venice, yes, there are many associations that this image invokes, as uh, um, many of you pointed out yesterday. I think somebody was talking about the, uh, the, cinema, you know, the, the reference to cinema, even Venice Film Festival. In Watermark, if you remember, Brodsky kind of revokes the same image, but now he's more specific in terms of the cinema camera film camera, he's talking about a Venice reminding him of Greta Garbo swimming, right? So there's an, <laughs> an allusion to a cinema there. Um, but yes, it has more literary reference as well. One such being Asip Mandelstam. Okay, now we're going back to this high cultural references. And here, actually, one of the things that is emblematic of Brodsky is just the way he fluctuates between the two. There are high cultural canonical references, and then there is everything possible from popular culture and a sort of more mundane or colloquial. And um, Mandelstam, well, again, we can start with the title, Venetiansky Strofe. Does this remind anyone here know Mandelstam's poetry? A title? a title of a poem, not Venetianske strofe, a Peterburgske strofe. That's the title of Mandelstam's poem. And, um, but then, to go back to Susanna, um, uh, that is actually the final image in Mandelstam's 1922 poem about Venice. And here you have it. О венецейской жизни, мрачной и бесплодной, для меня значение светло. Вот она глядит с улыбкой у холодной в голубое дряхлое стекло. Тонкий воздух кожи, синие прожилки, белый снег, зеленая парча. Всех кладут на кипарисные носилки, сонных, теплых вынимают из плаща. И горят, горят в корзинах свечи, словно голубь залетел в ковчег. На театре и на праздном вече умирает человек. Ибо нет спасения от любви и страха, тяжелее платины Сатурного кольцо, черным бархатом завешенная плаха и прекрасное лицо. Тяжелы твои Венеция уборы в кипарисных рамах зеркала, воздух твой граненый, в спальне тают горы голубого дряхлого стекла. Только в пальцах роза или склянка, адриатика зеленая, прости. Что же ты молчишь? Скажи, венецианка, как от этой смерти праздничной уйти? Черный веспер в зеркале мерцает, все проходит, истина темна. Человек родится, жемчуг умирает, и Сусанна Старцев ждать должна. Так что видите, последняя эм, там э, строка, the last line, Susanna has to wait for the elders. That is obviously what uh, Brodsky is referring to in uh, Venetianske Strofe. This is a typical uh, a poem of, of Mandelstam of this particular period. It's kind of apocalyptic. And uh, what would be a better sort of a, a paysage to project that apocalypse than the dying Venice, the myth of the dying Venice was a, 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 um, a well-known uh, myth in, in European culture at this point. And uh, um, Mandelstam, actually, now, the, yeah, this is something I am not sure about. When I last looked into this, which is um, more than 15 years ago, and this was actually, well, it was really in the mid, yeah, sort of in the middle of the 90s, mid 90s, uh, when Mandelstam was kind of coming, was sort of uh, becoming a, a, a topic in Slavic studies, which is what I academically represent. Um, and one of the reasons why he was sort of a, a you know, becoming um, a big thing was that the archives were open and was actually possible, you see, they were never quite sure what had happened to Mandelstam, how he died. He died in 1937 and he was one of the victims of Stalin's purges, but in, uh, in the early 90s, they were able to find, actually establish his, where he died, what happened to him and how that all, you know, took place. And, and then there was a, a great interest in Mandelstam. Mm. And, uh, 
I, I remember reading an article, a Russian article, where they were debating, the writer was debating with the possibility that Mandelstam might have actually gone to Venice on one of his trips to Germany, but they weren't sure. Now, I don't know if that fact has been established since, but if, if he did not come here, then he was one of the, he was probably the only of these great modernist uh, poets and writers, Russians, who did not come here. So this is all based on, uh, you know, poetic imagination, in that sense. And, um, now, yeah, well, I guess I, yes, is, many of you spotted yesterday the, um, the old the sujet from the Old Testament and uh, the, uh, sorry, the uh, book of um, Daniel's book, I think it is called in English, and the uh, sujet, the story about Susanna and Elders. And this is Tintoretto's painting. And as, as we uh, discussed, or as, well, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk today, the uh, um, personification of Venice's uh, uh, female, um, female uh, character was, uh, and a naked female uh, character was uh, typical in Venetian art. Here you have, well, let's put it this way. When you have this great Venetian artist, this Titian, Tizian, uh, and this is a lady at her toilet, uh, a, to um, a, a topos very common in, in Renaissance art. And so when you have a great Venetian artist showing a naked Renaissance lady like this, so, so this sort of uh, association between the female uh, figure and the personification of Venice is never kind of far. And here's another famous one. Uh, this is Bellini's lady at her toilet. Now, um, so uh, last but not least, just uh, briefly on Susanna in Venezieski Strophe II. Well, it most definitely can also refer to Brodsky's friend and contemporary Susan Sontag. Uh, I guess we mentioned this too. Uh, um, whom he mentions in Watermark in, in connection with the Jewish theme, and this we discussed in the first class, that is the visit to Isra Pound's lifelong companion, Olga Raj. I hope I didn't actually say that Olga Raj was Isra Pound's wife, because apparently he, she wasn't. They, I, I, in my understanding, that they were never married. Olga Raj, by the way, which is talked about Dama, <laughs> uh, Pounda, uh, this is something that uh, Brodsky, that this is the phrase Brodsky uses of her in Watermark. But really, she was a, a quite a well-known violinist, in fact. And she lived to be 101, which is quite um, an achievement as such. So what I'm saying is, of course, she, she was a person of her own right and, and quite famous and so on. But to get back to Susan Sontag, uh, there's a sort of a, an interesting um, reversal of dedications in Venetiansky Strofe, and also there is a very definitely a sort of a gay and lesbian subtext in, this, uh, in these poems. Uh, which is, again, an important uh, theme in, in the uh, cultural mythologies of Venice and in the in Venetian literature. And um, so, uh, Venetianske Strofe Adin is um, dedicated to Susan Sontag, and Venetianske Strofe Dva is dedicated to Gennady Schmakov. Now, Gennady Schmacko was Brodsky's friend, too, uh, but uh, he was from the Leningrad period. Although he lived in uh, New York, and uh, he died of AIDS in uh, 1988. And he was the friend whom um, Brodsky mentions in Watermark, if you remember, those of you who have read, he uh, goes back to all these sort of incidents and encounters with Venice that he had in Leningrad in the 1960s, and one of them is a, a collection of French... Um, collection of, uh, of stories by the uh, French writer Henri de Renier. They were translated by Michal Kuzmin. And the friend who gave him this collection of stories was uh, Shmakov, Gennady Shmakov. And he later, in, in the US, he became a translator and a critic. And I believe he wrote a biography of Mikhail Baryshnikov. Not, I've never seen this uh, biography, but I believe he did. And um, so you would imagine that with all this, the first poem, Venetianski Strophe Adin, which has all these musical references and mentions uh, Diaghilev, who was, of course, the uh, director of ba Ballet Russe and uh, also a very important figure in the sort of gay cultural history, Russian cultural history. You would imagine that this 
poem is dedicated to Schmack, but no, it's actually Kvenitsinski's Strophe that is uh, dedicated to Schmackov, whereas the, uh, the first one is dedicated to Susan Sontag, although Susanna is mentioned in the uh, second one. So, um, and that actually brings us to our today's topic, San Pietro. Avoiding the uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cliché touristic route, and now um, I have um, uh, uh, okay. Here's the thing: I could not find Joseph Brodsky reading this poem. To some of you, this may become as a relief, <laughs> since I know that uh, uh, listening to Joseph Brodsky reading his own poetry is just not every. It's not. For everyone, and we already did hear uh, uh, him reading the uh, Laguna. Now, the one, this this particular one that I found, I have to say, I personally, uh, it's silly to say this. It's not a good, good this, uh, teacher shouldn't say this, but I, I dislike it. <laughs> I'll be interested in hearing what you think of it. It's a very odd way of of, of reading this poem, but at least it's very different from Brodsky's. No, тогда это очень длинный это длинное стихи, так что длинное стихотворение, так что я не знаю, есть uh, volunteers. <laughs> Let, let's share it, shall we? Okay. В два часа по полудни силуэт почтальона приобретает в, поезде резкие, в подъезде резкие очертания, чтоб мгновение спустя снова сделаться силуэтом. Третью неделю туман не слезает с белой колокольни коричневого захолустного городка, затерявшегося в глухонемом лесу Северной Адриатики. Электричество продолжает в полдень гореть в таверне. Политняк мостовой отливает желтой жареной рыбой. Оцепеневшие автомобили пропадают из виду, не заводя мотора, и вывеску не дочитать до конца. Уже не терракоты и охра впитывают в себя сырость, но сырость впитывает охру и терракоту. Тень, насыщающаяся от света, радуется при виде снимаемого с гвоздя пальто, совершенно, не по, совершенно по христиански Ставни широко растопырены точно крылья, погрузившихся с головой в чужие неурядицы ангелов, там и сям, слезающая с трупьями штукатурка, обнажает красную воспаленную кладку, и третью неделю сохнувшие исподники настолько привыкли к дневному свету и к своей веревке, что человек, если выходит на улицу, то выходит в пиджаке на голое тело, в туфлях на босу ногу. В два часа по полудни силуэт почтальона приобретает в подъезде резкие очертания, чтобы мгновение спустя снова сделаться с силуэтом. Удары колокола в тумане повторяют эту же процедуру. В итоге невольно оглядываешься через плечо самому себе вслед, как иной прохожий, стремясь осмотреть получше щиколотки, прошлестевшей мимо красавицы, но ничего не видишь, кроме хлопьев тумана. Без ветрия, тишина, направление потеряно. За поворотом фонари обрываются, как белое многоточие, за которым следует только запах водорослей и очертания пирса. Без ветрия и тишина, как ржание, никогда не сбивающийся с пути чугунный кобыл Виктора Эммануэля, зимой обычно смеркается слишком рано, где-то вовне, снаружи, над головой, туго спеленутые крючковатой марлей стрелки над городских часах отстают от меркнущего вдалеке рассеянного дневного света. За сигаретами вышедший постоялец возвращается через 10 минут к себе, по пробуравленному в тумане его же туловищем туннелю. Ровный гул невидимого аэроплана напоминает жужжание пылесоса в заднем конце гостиничного коридора и поглощает стихая свет. «Небья!» – проносит зевая диктор, и глаза на секунду слепаются, наподобие раковины, когда проплывает рыба, зрачок погружается ненадолго в свои перламутровые потемки. И подворотня с лампочкой выглядит как ребенок, поглощенный чтением под одеялом. Одеяло все в складках, как тога евангелиста в нише. Настоящее, наше время со стуком отскакивает от бурого кирпича базилики точно белый кожаный мяч, вколачиваемый в нее с школьниками после школы. Щербатые, но не мыслящие себя в профиль обшарпанные фасады только голые икры кривых балясин одушевляют наглухо запертые балконы, где уже вот, где вот уже двести лет никто не появляется, ни наследница, ни кормилица, облюбованные брачующимися и просто скучающими чудищами карнизы. Колонада, оплывшая как сярин, 
и слепое, агатовое великолепие непроницаемого стекла, за которым скрывается кушетка пианино. Старые, но именно светом дня оберегаемые успешно тайны. В холодное время года нормальный звук предпочитает тепло гортани каприза меха. Рыбы безмолвствуют. В недрах материка распевает горлинка. Ни то, ни другое не слышно. Повиший над пресным каналом мост удерживает расплывчатый противоположный берег от попытки совсем отделиться и выйти в море. Так, вдохнув на стекло, выводит инициалы тех, с чем отсутствием не смириться. И подтек превращает заветный вензель в хвост морского конька. Вбирай же красной губкой легких плотный молочный пар, выдыхаемый всплывшую амфитриды и нее нереидами. Протяни руку, и кончики пальцев коснутся торса, покрытого пузырьками и пахнувшего в детстве йодом. Выстиранная, выглаженная простыня залива шуршит оборками, и бесцветный воздух на миг сгущается в голубе или в чайку, но тотчас растворяется. Вытащенные из воды лодки, баркасы, гондолы, плоскодонки, как непарная обувь, разбросанная на песке, поскрипывающим, поскрипывающим под подошвой. Помни, любое движение, по сути, есть перенесение тяжести тела в другое место. Помни, что прошлому не уложиться без остатков памяти, что ему необходимо будущее. Твердо помни, только вона, вода, и она одна, всегда и везде остается верной себе, нечувствительной к метафорам плоской, находящейся там, где сухой земли больше нет. И патетика жизни с ее началом, серединой, редеющим календарем, концом и т.д. стушевывается в виду вечной, мелкой, бесцветной ряби, жесткой, мертвой проволокой, виноградной лозы мел мелко вздрагивает от собственного напряжения. Деревья в черном саду ничем не отличаются от ограды, выглядящей как человек, которому больше ни в чем, и, главное, некому признаваться. Смеркается. Безветрие, тишина, хруст ракушечника, шорох раздавленного гнилого тростника, пинаемая носком, жестянка взлетает в воздух и пропадает из виду. Даже спустя минуту не расслышать звук ее падения в мокрый песок, ни тем более всплеска. Спасибо вам большое. Один из причин, почему я не читаю эти поэмы сама, не только мой финский акцент, хотя это, на самом деле, часть моего финского акцента, это, что если вы не говорите на native русском языке, и вы не говорите на русском каждый день, ударение, вы просто не помните, где они падают, и это вызывает смешные комические эффекты. Это было удивительно. Спасибо. Я люблю то, как вы читали это. This guy, I don't know what he's doing with it, but the fact is, of course, that this poem, this is how we can start analyzing it. This poem is quite different from most of Brodsky's poetry. So those two things that Brodsky almost always uses, rhymes and the um, uh, meter are absent. And, and sort of in one sense, we can say that it's kind of a formless structure, which supports the the, the, uh, the idea that it's uh, uh, describing this uh, landscape that has lost for all form, right? It's a, a, like a, obliterated uh, all kind of uh, arch architectural and topographical uh, markers. So it's just kind of, you know, um, like blank. So in that, that sense, the uh, structure of the poem, there is a structure, I'm not saying it's, it doesn't have structure, but the structure is not a formal structure. So in, in that sense, it's formless. And so it supports that. Okay, so one of the first people to do is, is, is John Ruskin, who was the, I mentioned him yesterday, do he's the big authority in, in British uh, classical uh, art history about Venice. And the Stones of Venice, this was a massive art historical or architectural work that he wrote in the middle of the uh, 19th century was a, a sort of a, a definitive authority on Venetian architecture history of Venetian architecture for British audience for a very long time. And uh, he has this little uh, part there, the present, and this is about San Pietro and the same church that uh, Brodsky writes about. The present church is among the least interesting in Venice. A wooden bridge, something like that of London's Battersea, on a small scale, connects its islands, now almost deserted, with a wretched suburb of the city behind the arsenal, and a blank level of lifeless grass rotted away in places rather than trodden is extended before its mildewed and solitary tower. So the solitary tower is there too. And Pavel Muratov would have got this sort of an understanding of Venice from 
from John Ruskin, without a doubt. Then there is Brodsky's contemporary. I wonder if any of you have ever heard of uh, Regis de Bré, at least. Yes, uh, rather controversial uh, uh, French uh, cultural uh, critic who's written a, a very interesting piece, actually, to read side by side Brodsky contre Venice, against Venice, an essay. It came out in 1999. It's a completely different take on Venice from Brodsky's. It's not a personal kind of uh, memoir, sort of a, a loving kind of, uh, you know, um, a confession of, of, of love and desire. <laughs> not at all. It is a cultural critic. He criticizes the European cultural elite for this sort of fascination with Venice, and, and Venice for him is really the symbol of the dead Europe, how Europe's completely, you know, outdated, and that we sort of uh, uh, nourish this fantasy of this beautiful Venice just shows how pathetic or we or whatever Europeans are. <laughs> so there. But even um, Debre, actually, uh, San Pietro de Castello is probably the only neighborhood that he kind of is a little bit forgiving and generous. And uh, here is Debre. I don't deny that in certain peripheral quarters off to the north of the railroad station, by the way, that's where we are, right? <laughs> And there is the same kind of a, a, a feeling to this neighborhood and the area here as this is San Pietro. So, for example, on the other end of the island, east of the arsenal, the picturesque disused part, which is, which is all for show, but the small functioning naval workshops. At twilight around San Pietro Canal, the esthete can finally feel disoriented anonymous, lost in pallid desolation, a no man's land without any local color. So if there's, <laughs> so this is why uh, he, he, uh, he likes San, San Pietro. So uh, even the effort to capture the non-touristic Venice, the Drogaia Venezia is a literary tradition, uh, speaking of uh, anxiety of influence, which uh, Simeon very um, uh, poignantly uh, uh, brought up at the introduction already to the uh, event. Uh, and so is depicting Venice in an unusual weather circumstances, such as the fog or the flood. The flood is another big one. And here we go back to 19th century again, and Prince uh, Kinyas Vyazemski, whom we mentioned yesterday, I told you that he visited Venice. And here's, uh, this is from his diary from the same year as uh, John Ruskin's The Stones of Venice, by the way. And I'm sorry it's in English, because I left the uh, Russian original at home, and I, I couldn't, uh, uh, I, I, I don't have it, so it's in English. We are no longer in Venice, but in Petersburg. It is the third day since the metamorphosis happened. Day after day, I'm sorry, day after day, the weather has been changing radically. Today, today the water rose from the canals, the pavement, exactly as in Chornaya Riechka. Venice is not a pleasant sight in ugly weather. Okay, so we don't have a fog here, but we have a flood. Это что такая чёрная речка? Это где? Да. Так что, yes, and yes, actually the place of Pushkin's duel, right? <laughs> okay, so now we are in чёрная речка. And... Um, so I think we are back to San Pietro's uh, multiple meanings, and, 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 and obviously Petersburg is evoked already in the title, right? San Pietro, St. Peter's. Uh, it, you can't really uh, uh, escape that, right? Uh, so, um, so Imbrowski describes Venice during Nebbia, the fog which, uh, as, as we've said now many times, obliterates, uh, 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 makes invisible what is his surroundings, and it kind of leaves space for this sort of mythopoetical imagination, if you like, to make this kind of a, a parallel between Venice and Petersburg, which exists not only in his personal life, perhaps, but also in Russian cultural mythology, right? And here I'm reminded of Yuri Lotman's uh, term, eccentric city, you, which you probably know, by which uh, this is in his article, uh, Semiotica Gorada, where he talks about Petersburg being that sort of uh, eccentric in the sense that it's on the border of sea and land, east and west, and then there's this collision of uh, natural and artificial. Well, the same goes for Venice, right? The, the, uh, you know, one city where Venice is built on water, artificial and natural collision, and Petersburg is, uh, is built on, on what? Finskoja Balota, right? <laughs> Finnish book, I beg your pardon. <laughs> so, uh, back. I got my moment. <laughs> so, um, 
So, uh, uh, so there, of course, uh, there's this whole like a cultural mythology at play here, not to speak of personal memories. And the personal note starts with the first lines. Those are a reference and an allusion to Umberto Saba, whom Brodsky translated from Italian into Russian. Um, so uh, the Umberto Saba has this autobiographical poem that starts, In the death of the wild Adriatic. And now if you look at this, uh, how the uh, San Pietro is hiding in the corner of uh, the, the North Adriatic, right? Uh, now actually Saba's poem is not about Venice, it's about his native town of Trieste, which is if possible even more in the corner. Well, where is uh, Bro Brodsky's native city? It's in the corner of the Baltic, right? So there is this parallel instantly there. But um, so the parallel, it, 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 only, it doesn't only invoke Petersburg, but it in, 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 on a th thematic level, it invokes the, uh, the theme of, of um, emigration. And now we get back to Auden, definitely. And the fog. Yes, thank you, fog was Auden's, uh, the title of Auden's last uh, collection of poems. And, and, um, and I'm going to uh, just very briefly say a few words about this uh, connection here. So Auden returned to England in 1972, because you know Auden was English, he was an Englishman, right? And he uh, emigrated to the US just before the Second World War. And in 1972, he, uh, went back to England and lived there for the last or so year of his life. And um, just, just before his, shortly before, uh, before his death in 1973, and there is, of course, this is an important moment in Brodsky's life because Auden, who was his great, you know, uh, uh, a model and whom he got to know personally, died soon after Brodsky had left the Soviet Union and settled in, in the West. So, um, so uh, just before his death in 1973, Auden published this collection of poems that you brought up. And um, there's a poem there called Thank You, Fog. And the uh, first line of the third stanza of that poem starts with this line, outside a shapeless silence. To me, it seems that this is what Brodsky picked on and wrote San Pietro about. It's like an elaboration on this, you know, this bis vietrie tishina, and this whole like a shapeless silence, what this poem is about. I think it is, it is very definitely Auden. So, uh, but now the uh, situation here is kind of reversed again. Auden uh, had returned to England, and this poem is, uh, you know, full of this kind of gratitude uh, of homecoming. I'm home and there's this native knowledge and the fog is the thing that kind of makes him think, for him is the native knowledge. And um, there's a stanza in that poem, I think this is the last one. Grown used to New York weather, all too familiar with smog, you, her unsullied sister, I'd quite forgotten and watched you bring to British winters, now native knowledge returns. And you can sort of see how with this nebbia, the Venetianska nebbia, Brodsky's native knowledge returns, perhaps, if you want to put it in those terms. But of course, in a completely different circumstances, he had no way of this. San Pietro was written in 1978, 1979. He has no way of returning to the Soviet Union, and here Auden has. But I don't think it ends here, and now we go back to watermark, and we go back to my point of sort of a call kind of uh, staging the transculturation, staging his kind of a sort of a, um, uh, sort of a translating himself for the English language audience. Uh, watermark ends in this, and we discussed this already, somebody brought it up uh, on Monday, that watermark ends with this long passage, well, long and long, long in that short book, passage and a memory, partially probably fictional, about Winston Auden, if you remember. Uh, Brodsky imagines Auden with, uh, with, his, with his friends, poet, poet, the other poets of his group, at the uh, Florian, the uh, cafe on uh, Piazza di San Marco. And you can find it, it's at the very end, you can look at it either in English or Russian in your booklet. It's the very last passage, uh, almost the last one in, in, in Watermark. And um, 
And what uh, actually what Brodsky, no, it's another poem. Brodsky remembers there or quotes not uh, thank you fog at all. Actually, he never mentions this poem. That would be far too easy. No, 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 no. He just, he sort of, you know, it's by way of, uh, he invokes it by way of allusions. But here he mentions the fall of Rome and a line from the fall of Rome. Uh, and that's the last line in a stanza from the fall of Rome, which is probably one of the most famous poems by Auden. And that whole stanza goes all together elsewhere. Oh, I think I have a, no, I don't have a. I'm sorry, okay, so I'll read it to you, it's very short. So, all together elsewhere, vast herds of reindeer move across miles and miles of golden moss silently and very fast. Um, so, and now he, he, he sort of he remembers uh, Auden, and um, to me this kind of a parallel uh, uh, reading of this intimate and, and probably partially fictional memory of Auden and San Pietro, sort of putting these two texts together, illustrates how Brodsky uh, um, negotiated between his two uh, sets of cultural knowledge, the Russian language and the English language one, and how he did it in the sort of discursive textual space of Venice. And, and to finish, uh, sort of wrap up, wrap it all up, since I started with a post-colonial approach to Venice, and I mentioned one of the uh, big names in post-colonial studies, Homi Baba. I want to come back to this uh, um, typology that Homi Baba has. He talks about Ovidian exile. It's from Ovid, you know, the Greek poet. And he said that this, the type of uh, exilic identity that he calls Ovidian believes that migration only changes the surface of the soul, preserving identity under its protean form. So yourself never changes, no matter what your circumstances are. Now, there's another type of exilic identity for Homi Baba, and that he calls Lucretian, Lucrezia, the other or one of the or another um, Roman poet. And for Lucretian exile, Crossing cultural frontiers permits freedom from the essence of the self. And to me, to me it seems that Watermark, this whole like uh, English language performance of it, shows how Brodsky eventually somehow becomes the Lucretian exile. It, it narrates this process of this conflict between these two kind of sort of uh, identities or subjectivities uh, and shows the outcome of Brodsky's exilic experience. And to me, uh, uh, Watermark especially shows how Venice becomes this sort of a, the site or the space where this kind of a, a reinvention of his, his exilic self takes place, if you want to put it in these post-colonial terms, which I, I do realize can be a little off-putting, but I do think that they conceptualize something of, of, of how, how I at least understand Brodsky's, um, Brodsky's or the significance of Venice for Brodsky, which was which I, what I said we would talk about in this course.